a colloquium on quantitative life sciences, which we are organizing uh, jointly between ICP QLS Saxon and uh, IIT Mumbai. Uh, as, as we said in previous editions, this is a, a very open talk on uh, active matter dedicated to the general public and students. So uh, I remind the, the audience that um, the speaker is uh, happy to, to reply to questions, especially if they are short <laughs> during his, his talk. If you have more technical questions, you can keep them for the end of the, of the seminar. Uh, he also announced that uh, in the middle of the, there will be a break uh, halfway of the talk uh, because he will present two topics. So you can also ask questions about the first topic in this break. And with no more delays, uh, I give my, the word to my colleagues from Mumbai who will introduce the speaker. Uh, thank you, Edgar. Um, so it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Gerhard Gompa to the monthly colloquium uh, jointly organized by ICTP and IIT Bombay. Uh, Professor Gomba did his uh, diploma and PhD in physics at Ludwig Maximilian University in Julisch, uh, sorry, in Munich. He did his postdoctoral work uh, at the University of Seattle. And after the postdoctoral work from 94 to 99, Professor Gomba was a scientist at uh, Max Planck Institute for Colloids and Interfaces. At that time, it was in Berlin. And uh, from 99 onwards, Professor Gomber uh, is a director uh, of the Division of Theoretical Soft Matter and Biophysics at the Institute of Complex Systems and Institute of Advanced Simulations at Forschung Center Julisch. And uh, from 2000 onwards, uh, he's a full professor at the University of Cologne. Uh, professor Gomber's group has made uh, many significant contributions to the study of non equilibrium dynamics of uh, many soft matter systems including polymers, membranes, vesicles, red blood cells, and active cell propelling particles. The group has pioneered and developed um, many computational tools, especially to study the hydrodynamic nature of such uh, the dynamics of um, soft matter systems, and which has been widely used today. Today, we'll be talking about computational physics of active elements and membranes and cells. Uh, without further ado, I uh, welcome Professor to Go, Professor Gompa, to start the colloquium. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks to both of you for the nice introduction. Back with this um, mistake, Julich in Munich is, is not uncommon. <laughs> many people, Some when, when, when I say Forschung sind in Munich, they say, what? Forschung sind in Munich? <laughs> okay, that's right. <laughs> okay, let me uh, start. So I want to tell you something about the physics of active filaments, membranes, and uh, cells today. I'll do it. Okay. So um, let me start. Yeah, sorry, I think there was one speaker who had the microphone on, but uh, the problem is solved. So yeah, I think uh, Gerhard, please unmute once. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I mean, the problem is with this laser point that also has to switch back and forth, but no problem. Okay, so uh, I just want to uh, give you a couple of examples uh, for active matter in, in biological systems, also in, in synthetic systems. And um, so let me start with the cytoskeleton. Like you see here a movie, which you don't see. Okay, guys, I sorry, I, I, I have to switch from the laser pointer to this... Uh, um, this arrow, because otherwise I cannot operate the movies and so on. All right, so the first is this uh, cytoskeleton, and there's this interesting phenomenon of uh, cytoplasmic streaming. Come on. Yeah, no. Yeah, so you see here, this is driven, uh, this is in a, driven by the cytoskeleton network in the micro of microtubules in the Drosophila oocyte. And uh, the mechanism uh, you can see here on the left, right? so the two micro, um, microtubules or any two microtubules which are connected by uh, kinesin motors are pushed uh, relative to each other and that sets into motion uh, this whole network. But this is can be studied more easily, uh, such phenomena can be studied more easily in motility assays where um, motor proteins, in this case it's myosin and actin, so myosin is anchored on the cover slip it grabs on uh, actin filaments, which are on top, and then uh, pushes them, them forward. 
You know, so this is a system which can be studied much more easily in the lab. Another example is uh, motile bacteria. And uh, I don't, I'm not really quite sure about the mechanism which, by which they operate. Maybe this is a bit uh, complication, it still needs to be clarified. But the uh, behavior is quite uh, spectacular, if you, as you can see here. Also, this is not only the uh, motion of single particles, as you saw for the cytoplasmic streaming, uh, but many of these bacteria in interact and uh, um, contribute to their relative motion. And the last uh, thing I want to show is cell motility. Sorry, this is not a movie. This is a crawling parasite on a substrate, and it's moving in the uh, in the B direction. Yeah, so it has this characteristic shape, uh, sickle-like uh, shape, and it's uh, moving uh, forward quite persistently. Yeah. So uh, in, in all these uh, systems which I've shown you, I think the important point which I want to focus on today is this interplay of propulsion and uh, deformation. Yeah, you have, se you have seen this here, the uh, shape is, is uh, not, not spherical, uh, but also, I mean, and this is only during the motion and also, if you think of the bacteria before, right, they are strongly deforming because of the propulsion. All right, so in the first part of my talk, I want to uh, tell you something about these active uh, filaments. And there are different ways of propelling a filament. Uh, I want to focus on one particular case, which is tangential propulsion. Yeah, so you have this uh, filament, which you see here, uh, on. At, at each uh, point, uh, if, if you think of a discretized uh, chain and on each of the uh, beads which make up the chains, there's a propulsion force and the propulsion force is always in the tangential direction of the filament. Yeah, the, this clearly is a, uh, has a polarity. So in this case, it's moving from the uh, light gray side to the uh, dark gray side. All right, so if you um, want to model such an object, you can just take your favorite uh, polymer model. I mean, we use a bead spring warm like chain model. We will uh, also talk about several filaments that you will also see that already for a single filament excluded volume can be uh, important. And this is done by uh, overlapping Leonard Jones potential, weak um, gender Anderson potentials, which are purely repulsive. Uh, and then I mentioned that there's this active tangential driving force. And uh, essentially, in everything I've said today, there will be no hydrodynamic interaction uh, included. So it's essentially a brown in, all, all our Brownian dynamic simulations. All right, then if you think of this problem, then uh, you can define a couple of dimensionless numbers. Right? One is the persistence length, which is uh, bending rigidity over KT divided by the filament length. So that means if, if this uh, persist, dimensionless persistence length is uh, larger than uh, one, that means uh, it's a rather stiff object. If it's less than one, that is quite flexible. Then we have the Pickley number, which is the velocity times the length of the object divided by the translational diffusion coefficient. And you can also translate this into a, a propulsion force times length scale squared over KT. And, um, then we have the flexion number, which is measures is, is a ratio. It's 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 not a new number. It's it's the ratio of Pegli number and um, persistence length. But still, it's sometimes uh, interesting to see because it tends to tells you the balance between uh, curvature energy, curvature forces, and propulsion forces. All right. So if you throw this thing then uh, into a two-dimensional box and uh, Right. So this is this uh, flexible filament. The bullets here are just markers. There are no obstacles. So they're just that you can see the, the, uh, the motion of the uh, filament more clearly. Yeah, you, so you, you see it moves. Of course, in this particular case, uh, the persistence length is rather small. So therefore it's uh, strongly fluctuating. Uh, and you can also see indications that there is a, a tendency for uh, spiral formation. And that's why where the um, excluded volume interaction actually comes into play. All right. 
Now, uh, if we do this, look at this uh, in a bit more detail as a function of uh, some parameters, and I will tell you about the parameters in a minute, then uh, we can distinguish uh, two or three different uh, behaviors. Right, so the first behavior is uh, what is shown here in A, uh, what, we, what I call the polymer regime. And uh, you can see the conformations of the polymer of, of this uh, filament here in the insets. And what the, the red is the trajectory of the center of mass. Yeah, so you see it's kind of a random walk like motion and uh, the conformations at each moment yeah, look pretty much like a semi flexible polymer. Yeah, then uh, there's this intermediate regime, which we call, I, mean, I still first go to the right hand side, the strong, strong spiral regime. And you just look here and in this little inset, you see sometimes the polymer winds up in a, in a very tight uh, spiral. Yeah, this, and you can see this also in the trajectory. This is when there's hardly any motion. You have only some uh, local diffusion. And then the, the polymer is extended again. It moves forward uh, ballistically, well, almost ballistically persistently. Then it spirals up again, moves again, and so on. And then there's the regime in between, which we call the weak spiral regime. Just the number of spirals is uh, spiraling events is, uh, is less frequent. All right, now uh, look at this in a little bit more detail. And one of the interesting uh, aspects we, we found is that there is an enhanced rotational diffusion. Yeah, what is plotted here is the rotational diffusion coefficient of the whole chain, yeah, given by the, uh, I will explain this in the next transparency, given by the end-to-end -end vector of the chain uh, as it rotates. And this is shown, uh, this is shown here as a function of the flexion number. And you see that there is, uh, yeah, there is very little uh, rotational diffusion, just the passive rotational diffusion for small activity. And then uh, when the activity becomes bigger, there seems to be a kind of a universal behavior because the, the, all the data for a very different uh, persistence length all fall onto a single line. And this is single line has slope one. So rotational diffusion increases uh, linearly uh, with, uh, with activity. So how we can we understand this, this behavior? And this is a little a theory, it's about the almost trivial theory. But so uh, we look at the end-to-end -end vector Te as a function of time related to the tangent vector at uh, earlier time zero. And that decays exponentially with this rotational diffusion coefficient. That's just the definition of our rotational diffusion coefficient. Yeah, then um, if we want to, then we have this linear increase reflection number. I actually explained this to you. So now uh, our little theory, yeah, let's assume we have a railway type motion of the filament. That is the filament is, has the conformation, the same is like a section of a very long uh, um, polymer chain which has this, uh, it's just an equilibrium conformation. Yeah, so think of a very long, infinitely long polymer. And um, the polymer we're looking at, the motion is just the motion along of a, of a little segment along this railway given by the infinitely long uh, polymer. So for the infinitely long polymer, we know what the tension tension vector correlation is. Let's say it's passive at the moment. So, uh, for the stars, so velocity is zero, uh, which means it's not, not time dependent. And then uh, the correlation function T of S, T of S prime is just an exponential decay, exponent of S minus S prime divided by the persistence length. Now, if they say, if uh, we are think of this, uh, our little polymer moving just as a part of a long polymer, then that just means the position S changes as prime is unchanged, then S becomes S minus or plus uh, velocity times T. So that's the motion along the chain. Yeah, and if you use this relation and just say, okay, the, uh, for the end-to-end -end vector, of course, we have to integrate the tension vector over S from zero to L, similar over S prime from zero to L, 
which is a very easy calculation, it's just an exponential function, then we get again an exponential decay as predicted here. And the result is the rotational diffusion coefficient is the driving velocity divided by, this, by the persistence length, which is exactly this uh, linear universal linear behavior, uh, which we see here, where universal of course comes because we divide here by the persistence length for uh, different persistence lengths. All right, so that I hope that gives you a feeling where this uh, enhanced rotational diffusion comes from. Now, if you look at a kind of a phase diagram uh, of um, persistence length versus uh, Peglin number, then uh, I think this is not too surprising that we see the spiral regime when the persistence length is high, strong propulsion, and the persist, uh, sorry, the, when the Peglin number is high and the persistence length is low, because if the persistence length is low, then it's easy for the, for the uh, front part of the chain to have a high curvature and hit the tail and thereby start the spiraling. Similar, if the uh, um, persistence length is high and the Peglin number is low, we are in the uh, polymer regime because the polymer behaves more like a, a um, passive, passive polymer. And the boundary between the two is this green, green line. And this is roughly given by persistence length proportional to Peglin number. This will uh, occur again and again in this, what I'm uh, telling you afterwards. And I, uh, I think that it's relatively easy to understand, right? Because we need, we need a propulsion strength, a propulsion force, which is uh, comparable to the uh, bending strength, the bending forces. And since the bending forces are given by the, persist uh, by the um, no, bending rigidity or the persistence length, I think this is a natural result to expect bending forces and propulsion forces are similar. And then you see the transition between the two. If, if persistence dominates, activity plays a little role. If persistence dominates, then this is dominating and leads to this uh, highly non-equilibrium uh, kind of behavior. Yeah, but it's also shown here, this purple region, this is the param parameter space for actin filaments on these myosin carpets for this motility assays. So we would claim that it would be possible to see this uh, transition from polymer to strong to, to spiraling in these uh, motility assays. All right. Um, so now this was for a single filament. Now let's look at um, what happens if the concentration increases. We, I mean, this we are talking here still at a very small concentration. Should be set here somewhere. Uh, okay, it's on the order 0 0.01 or 0. Um, okay, I can't see it now. Anyway, maybe maybe the pictures are in, on the way, no. Okay, this is at a relatively small uh, concentration in any case. Um, so um, let me just play the movie. Maybe I'll start with the movie here at the bottom. This is very short filament. And this is actually a behavior we have not really uh, fully understood uh, the dependence of the spiraling on the on the length of the filament. Yeah, as I show you here, small filaments show some spiraling, but not much spiraling. Longer filaments show much stronger spiraling. And I think the reason is if you uh, that the width of the chain that the, uh, also plays a role because if you think of a short chain, you can only wind it uh, say two times around itself, then the length is exhausted. If you have a very long polymer, you, of course, you can do it much, uh, much more often. So uh, for the longer polymers, we say, see this much stronger spiraling. Yeah, it's maybe difficult to see, but these little bullets, these are all spirals. And if you watch carefully, and I can't tell you where to look, then sometimes you see that the polymers unspiral, they uh, become extended, they move, they come are in this polymer scheme, and they spiral, then they spiral again. And uh, there's quite... Uh, uh, the significant um, concentration dependence, which you see here in the plot on the right. Yeah, so if we first look at the spiral number, so that is how many uh, times the polymer is around, uh, wound around itself, or you can call it a winding number if you like. This is the blue uh, um, parts and averaged over all polymers. So you see if the concentration is very low, 
all polymers spiral, there's hardly uh, any uh, extended chains. But as the um, concentration increases, uh, polymers hit each other, they help to unspiral, and therefore the spiral number quickly uh, goes down as a function of concentration. At the same time, also the clustering uh, increases, that's the red bullets, and you see that as, as the spirals decrease, polymers become uh, more extended, they uh, collide with each other and form clusters, and that, you, that is indicated here by this cluster number. Now, um, this is now at the highest packing fraction of what, what we had in the previous uh, graph. Maybe I go back. So 0.2, this is, this is here. So that's the, the largest, um, largest concentration. And uh, now you see uh, at low packing number uh, on the left, we see uh, the formation of these big uh, mobile uh, clusters, motile clusters. And this is actually very uh, similar because the persistence length is relatively large, right? Here's the persistence length is 16 times larger than the length of the chain. So this is essentially stiff rods. And you see the stiff rods, they collide, they form these big clusters, which collect more uh, clusters and so on. And these are, are, are quite uh, stable. Also their motion is very persistent. Now, if you do hard rods and you increase the Peglin number, this clustering even increases. But if you do this for the uh, flexible chains, you see something completely different happens. These big clusters actually break up into smaller clusters. Yeah, And this is again because the clusters are very flex, polymers are flexible, and they can easily avoid uh, the, uh, uh, this, is these uh, strong deformations in, the, in these big clusters. Oops. No. Yeah, so from these simulations, we can then construct the phase diagram. Again, persistence length versus Peclet number. This is all for the same packing fraction, which I just explained to you. And then you see, again, persistence length high, uh, Peclet number moderate. You see the big, uh, this giant cluster, which you saw on, on the light, uh, on the left movie in the previous transparency. If the um, Peclet number you, is high, you see it breaks up into small clusters because of the deformability. And uh, if the Peclet number is very small, you also see no clusters simply because the propulsion is too weak. Yeah, so um, again, the, the transition between the giant clusters and the, uh, this break up into smaller clusters with increasing Peclet number is again given by the same relation which I emphasized before that the persistence length is proportional of the Beckley number, and that is this uh, dashed line which you see here in the phase diagram. So I also want to show you uh, a, a few results for even bigger uh, volume fraction. So this is 0.8. So that means essentially everything is full with uh, polymers. Again, everything is in, in 2D, which I tell you. And uh, now we can look at, uh, again, propulsion for very small Beckley number. And you see not much is happening. Not much is happening. Again, I have an echo, I think. Um, yeah, so the, we call this the champ phase. Then if the Peclet number increases, then uh, polymers start to move and align uh, themselves. And this leads to this lamellar ordering because the uh, flexibility is still uh, small, relatively small compared to the uh, propulsion forces. And the most spectacular behavior is seen if you go to really strong forces. And then you see uh, what we call a turbulent phase. And I think it looks uh, pretty turbulent. And you should uh, compare this with a movie which I showed you in the beginning of Proteus Mirabilis. And I think there is at least some uh, apparent uh, similarity. It, lo it looks actually quite quite similar, but we have not looked at this into uh, more detail yet. So why do we call this turbulent phase? Well, uh, our justification for calling this turbulent is uh, if you look at the uh, power spectrum, yeah, and uh, so you see the definition of the power spectrum here, E of K, K is a wave vector, it's the uh, equal time correlation function uh, of the velocity 
uh, yeah, at, at different positions separated by uh, uh, wave, uh, a vector r and then just Fourier transform with respect to this uh, positional vector. Well, this is a, a quantity which is often looked at in hydrodynamic turbulence, in, in the classic turbulence. And there one finds that the, uh, this is a power law behavior. This is the famous law of Kolmogorov that this uh, goes like wave vector to the minus five over three. Now you see here on the, uh, on the left, our, our results for this flexible polymer in the active turbulent phase. And you see uh, they all also show the, uh, a power law decay, which we take as an indication of this um, uh, active turbulence. Uh, the, the power law is a little different, right? It's not uh, 1.6, but 1.2. Uh, but of course, it's also a, a probably a different kind of turbulence. Uh, um, but this is still under uh, in active investigation. Yeah, and then if you look again, here at the phase diagram, you see a similar behavior as you would expect. You go from jamming to laning to active turbulence with increasing Peclet number, but jamming and laning uh, becomes more dominant as the uh, polymers become stiffer and therefore act more like um, straight uh, uh, rigid rods. All right, so let me briefly summarize this part. So I think I've shown you that active polymers have a complex dynamics and collective behavior. Uh, that single uh, uh, self-propelled polymers sh uh, show this spiraling at high flexion number. And that for collective motion, we see that flexibility leads to cluster breakup at uh, relative low concentration and to active turbulence at a uh, high volume fraction. I didn't have time to talk today about uh, active brownie polymers, which is a different, not a, tangential uh, propulsion, but uh, each, each uh, bead in the chain has its own propulsion direction. Uh, so this is for another time. All right, so before, before I come to my next uh, part, I would say uh, maybe we can have a few questions now. Uh, Gerhard, can I start uh, with some? So when you uh, discuss the first, um, a single polymer yeah you had the spiral formation and uh, you see that uh, the polymer switched from the spiral to straight configuration right yeah yeah but then uh, is it like when you calculate the rotational diffusion are you calculating the average rotational diffusion which because i, I this was only you, this was only in the polymer regime i see okay. i mean i've not included any spirals in the spiral regime of course the rotational diffusion would be I mean, there would be no rotational diffusion at all. There would be a, a linear increase of the, of, the, of the angle of the vector, which just rotate with a constant uh, velocity. And, and okay. of course, if you would average over two, yeah, you average over a diffusive regime and this somewhat ballistic regime of the, of the rotational motion. Sure, thank you, yeah. Um, yeah, Rajashi, uh, can you unmute and ask? Yeah, so, uh, so my question is, uh, uh, if you turn on hydrodynamics, you don't have hydrodynamics here. So what is going to happen to this exponent? And you still see this sort of turbulence or things are going to change? This is my first question. Yeah. Okay. And let me answer this question. I mean, yes, turbulent, of course, changes uh, many things. And um, yeah, it's difficult for me to say exactly, I mean, to, to, say, to say in uh, two words, what is uh, exactly uh, changing. Um, I mean, maybe we can discuss this a little bit more detail uh, at the end. Okay, and another question. Has anybody looked at this in the presence of obstacles? So you have a bunch of obstacles and you have these uh, uh, active polymers, and many, many of them um, on I a computer. Am, I'm not aware of one right now, but maybe one of, the, of my collaborators can, can help. So I, okay, okay. Uh, we can discuss later. No yeah, problem. Yeah. Thank you. Mithun? Yeah, so I had one question regarding this uh, cluster formation that you showed. So it seemed like there was uh, some sort of a density banding. So there was the high density clusters coexisting with the low density phase. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, is that a long time stable phase, uh, this sort of a density band that appears? Yes. And secondly, yes, yes. Uh, Inside the clusters, is there any sort of um, 
polar order that develops or is it a uh, is there a pneumatic order in that sense it's not that i mean okay you saw okay the, the questions is i mean when, when i try, talk about giant cluster of course this is always quote quote a two-phase coexistence right because otherwise you would not see a cluster a cluster means it's in a sea of of low density mm -hmm. yeah so therefore i mean when, when i talk about cluster this is all, so maybe i can just go back briefly to the phase diagram right so uh here on the on the left i mean if you go to to high persistence length yeah so at the on the left this is many small clusters okay again of course in a sea of essentially no clusters or mm -hmm. in, in, in a background with with just individual uh, then then come the giant clusters yeah that's was in the movie you saw and mm -hmm. it's in in this surrounded by this gas phase so you can think of it as a consistent coexistence of the quote cluster state and the dilute state okay yeah okay. and then of course at high you can again have yeah, many small cluster many a little larger clusters in a sea of uh, smaller clusters so either you think of it as a phase of uh, bigger particles moving in, in in quote vacuum or you think again as a two-phase coexistence but i think this is more complicated right because the glasses are not so big so the easiest i think is to think of it in the in the giant cluster yeah, there you can think of it like a two-phase coexistence okay then okay. and then your second question was about the polar order inside ah, the polar, the yeah yeah this is a polar order when you you see this here but the, the all the particles I, I start the movie again yeah all the clusters move in a certain direction and um this is i mean the, the filaments are polar mm -hmm. the filaments okay. are all moving in one direction you could have in principle also a pneumatic state where mm -hmm. particles moving uh, opposite to each other and i mm -hmm. think you see this here in the in this case here in the middle uh, it's a bit difficult to see yeah, but, but here for example here on the top yeah, mm -hmm. you see the particles are moving to the left on the bottom particles are moving to the right so okay. it's not impossible but i think the normal case is that it's a polar cluster okay thank you thank you okay, georgia can you please unmute okay, yes thank you yeah i also have a, a um, kind of a similar question so i was wondering whether the um, the size of these giant cluster or the extent of the laning uh, of this laning phase here also is some kind of, un of universal so that um, if the system size increases, then the giant clusters just get infinitely large or because it seems, I mean, to me, at, at least um, from the first impression, it seems that there is also some uh, um, self uh, amplification. So some finite size effects. Is this, uh, so do I mean, you know? This is, yeah, this is, this is a, a good, but very difficult uh, question. And I cannot really answer. The problem is, uh, it depends of course, of course a bit on the density and and blah 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 but the the, the problem is but i mean you see this i mean if you go a little further here right i mean you yes. see essentially you get a cluster which is spanning the whole system and then you would say okay now uh, it's a finite size effect right it, it forms a big band but mm -hmm. maybe it would not form this big band if the system would be bigger but it's simply very difficult to make a, a simulation for a, a bigger and bigger and bigger system. So we have not been able to, to answer this uh, question. But I mean, I would also, my feeling would be, yeah, uh, um, it, it will not form uh, forever one single band, but the band will start to break up into smaller pieces. Okay, thank you. Uh, 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 yeah, thank you. Um, I have a um, question on the turbulence state that you showed. Yeah. So different from hydrodynamic turbulence, your uh, turbulence uh, breaks down at some point and there is a characteristic length scale associated yes, with it. Yeah. Uh, do you have an idea what that length scale is in your system? Um, no, not really. I mean, this is actually a problem which is not only in this simulation, but the same uh, appears in other kinds of active turbulence. Yeah, people have looked at it, for example, at uh, various bacteria, I mean, not, I mean, not the one, this, not this Proteus mirabilis, which I was talking about, but E. coli and some other uh, shorter polymers, and you see this active turbulence, and there's always this peak, which, as you co correctly point out, is not seen in hydrodynamic turbulence. Mm. And 
but I think there is, to, to my knowledge, there is not really a good explanation where this peak uh, comes from. It's typically, I mean, I'm not even sure what we have here. Uh, it's typically about an order of magnitude uh, below the, the peak, which uh, the, the position which would correspond to size of the, of the particles. And this is what happens for the bacteria. I'm not quite, I mean, I've not looked at it from this point of view here. So I, I, I cannot tell you. Uh, so the question is no, I, I don't know. And I think there is no clear, no good explanation at the moment. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Pramod, can you please? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I have a very basic question. Uh, what drives this cluster formation? Is it very similar to the cluster formation in uh, uh, spherical self-propelled particles? Or I mean, what is there a simple physical understanding of? Uh, I mean, in, prin in principle, it's similar. I think it's a bit different from but because I mean, here we have some aligning system. So if two particles come together, they hit each other, they align and maybe move in the same direction, but that would lead to the polar cluster or maybe move into opposite direction that would lead to a pneumatic ordering. But this is different from spherical particles or disk particles, right? Because they would bump each, into each other and there's no alignment. So they, um, even if they hit some apparel, they will not move somehow in, in the same direction or align their propulsion yeah. directions. Therefore, it's a little diffi difficult and uh, different, sorry, not difficult, uh, a, a different kind of clustering, right? In, in, the, um, in the spherical particles, you would not see these elongated clusters which are moving forward, but you would see more stationary clusters where all the particles essentially point towards the center, roughly point towards the center of the cluster. But, but still the, the general mechanism, I think is not so different, but it means particles hit each other, they move uh, in, in parallel for a little while. And then in the, in the meantime, other, cluster, uh, other particles come from the side, they hit this little uh, nucle nucleus, and in this way, the, the, these clusters grow. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Pradim, would you like to ask the question yourself? Uh... Yeah, I just wanted to know what is the color coding uh, in this movie? I mean, this color keeps... The color changing. coding is the ori orientation. Yeah, so that okay. I, I can't tell you which color is, stands for what, but if the particles are whatever moving upwards, they are blue. And if they're moving, let's, let's uh, see, see again. But if they're moving downwards, they are greenish. If they move upwards, they are bluish. If they move uh, whatever to the to the left, then they are red right and, and so on. Yeah, so it just so shows the the direction of motion of the different parts of the cluster. Thanks. Okay, so I don't see any more questions. Uh, okay, good. Yeah, because we should really start to. <laughs> you can go ahead with the move next on. Part. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So maybe I try to speed up the next part a bit. So as I say, this is now about active particles in cells or in, in, um, in near membranes. And this is just a reminder uh, from the a review article by Blanchon in uh, 2014 about the mechanism, how cells are believed to move uh, due to actin polymerization and, um, and, and motor proteins. Yeah. So uh, all I want to say is uh, here there are many active filaments inside this uh, membrane shell, and they lead to the to the propulsion to the motion of the cell. So we have. Uh, I want to start with a very simple model again in in two D. This is uh, very similar to what I've shown you before. We take these little active filaments, which are here this chain of blue beads. Uh, doesn't want me to allow for it to proceed, and. Uh, and these little rods, in this case, we have no flexibility. It's a stiff rod. They are propelled in the forward, come on. They are propelled in the forward direction, but they are anchored to the membrane particles, either at the front or at the end. So in this way, if, uh, because we can uh, have uh, anchoring at the front of the end, it can either be filaments which push towards the membrane if they're anchored in front, or they can, uh, pull on the membrane if they are pulled at the end. Yeah, and then if we have several filaments, we have a uh, repulsive interaction, but we take 
a finite repulsion. So if that particles can actually overlap or actually move across each other, and this is given by this uh, overlap energy ER. So you can think of it as a capped uh, Lenny Jones interaction. And in addition, we have a membrane friction with a membrane uh, with a substrate. Yeah, so this ring, this membrane ring, which is moving on the substrate, has a friction uh, with the substrate, and the particles themselves also have a friction with the substrate. So now let's see what what happens. Yeah. So the behavior is of course um, uh, determined either whether you have pushing particles, pulling particles, or mixed system with both pushing and pulling, and important uh, is the Peclian number uh, the, and the, this repulsive energy. Yeah, so if the repulsion is very uh, small, ER is equal KT, that means the particle can easily move across each other. Whereas if uh, the uh, repulsive energy is high, then they form these uh, little clusters. Yeah, and now you see a very different kind of motion. Yes, for these pushing rods, which are then aligning because the repulsive energy is very small, they are essentially aligning parallel to the membrane, moving around the membrane. And this leads to a very erratic, random walk like motion. I have no idea what I'm doing wrong. Okay, anyway. So, uh, whereas if you have pushing and pulling rods, but then you see this little cluster here of uh, pulling particles and a little cluster of pushing particles, and they uh, exert a torque on, on the cell. And therefore, in this case, you get this circular motion, rather persistent circular motion. If you have only pulling rods, the pulling rods uh, also form these little clusters. And this is um, a, a smaller Peclian number. That's why cluster formation is more pronounced. And uh, you see this rather persistent motion in one direction, which arises from all particles pulling in the same direction, Most part, many particles pulling in the same direction. Now, this was just a warm up. Of course, it becomes more interesting if the membrane is actually deformable, right? Because then the particles not only uh, push or pull, move the, uh, the cell, but they also deform the membrane. And here we can again distinguish uh, three different classes this kind of fluctuating shape where uh, the cell shape does not, uh, does not change much, it shows some active fluctuation. This kind of keratocyte like shape, just think of the uh, picture of the keratocyte, which I showed you in the beginning. I'm not going back to all to the beginning. Um, yeah, and um, in this case, this, all these pulling roots also lead to a flattening of the membrane in the rear. And then we have this uh, kind of uh, shapes, which we call uh, neutrophil shapes, because they resemble a little the, the shape of uh, neutrophils. Now, what is interesting is that if you uh, uh, look at the uh, deformability, the shapes, and the motion of all these different objects for different number of uh, part, uh, for different propulsion strength, for different number of uh, rods inside, uh, and so on, then we find uh, there is a can be a, is a classification of uh, of the shape and and the velocity. So all the particles which are here for negative aspherosity, these are the ones which have a extension uh, orthogonal to propulsion direction. These are the keratocyte shapes and they all have roughly the same velocity. I mean, not the same velocity. I, I don't tell you exactly what scaled means because it becomes a bit technical, but it just means of course, if you have more rods and they push more strongly, then it's clear that the velocity increases, but that has been scaled out here. Yeah, so the trivial factors have been re removed. But by the same, uh, I mean, this scaling is done the same for all the different shapes. Yeah, so you see that this is the keratocyte glass. This is the, this neutrophil glass. This is a kind of a slightly different neutrophil. So all the neutrophils are here. And these are the fluctuating shapes because they have essentially zero aspherosity and roughly no, no velocity. So the point I want to make is that there is a close connection between cell shape and cell motility if you have this internal driving. Yeah, now this is, it becomes interesting if we now look at the interaction with such object with uh, hard walls or with uh, interfaces. Yeah, so in this case, we here look at a hard wall. So we took a uh, look at this shape and uh, it starts, the hard wall is somewhere around here. 
on the uh, on the right hand side of this uh, figure, and uh, it it approaches the the wall under uh, various angles, and then you see in this particular case it actually starts to move along the wall. I mean this is more easy to see here in this movie. Yeah, the wall the wall is here on uh, on the flat part on the on the right, and you see the pushing filaments push the particle towards the wall. Therefore, it does not detach from the wall. And the pulling filaments, they all um, uh, keep pulling and therefore move it parallel to the wall. Yeah, uh, this is different if, uh, if you look at the middle figure. In this case, we have only pulling filaments. And you see that the part, uh, again with different, <sighs> this makes me nervous. Um, anyway. Okay, so in this case, you see again with different uh, incidence angles that it's not sticking close to the wall, but due to the rearrangement of the internal filaments, the particle is actually, the cell is actually reflected from the wall. And this is actually quite similar to what uh, has been observed in the experiments. This is a keratocyte moving on a surface. And here is some uh, textures part of the surface, which the keratocyte does not want to, to touch. Yeah, so it, it acts a little bit like a hard wall. And you see it bumps into the wall, it reorients and it moves away from the wall again. And if you look at this, this is analysis of this uh, experimental movie, you see there are many different incidence angles. Uh, uh, this is a flat incident, small incidence angle. This is a very large incident angle, but all of them uh, come out uh, when they are reflected, come out with roughly the same incidence angle. And this is very similar to what we also see here, which you see here. But then uh, there you see that right, we have the different incidence angles, but many of them here come out uh, at, at essentially the same um, reflection angle. Uh, all right, um, maybe I go through this very quickly so we can uh, go do, do something similar for, um, for a friction interface. So the, the, uh, the friction with the substrate it di is different in the gray region and in the, in the uh, white region. And let me just show you this movie because in this case, again, we can have this uh, capturing uh, by the interface. Yeah, so the particle comes, the cell comes close to the interface it reorients. Uh, you see that the green bullet here shows that there's actually a tank threading motion of the membrane because the friction here on the uh, um, on the white side is lower than on the on the uh, grayish side. Therefore, this leads to this rotational motion while the cell is actually uh, propagating parallel to the interface. All right, so let me come uh, and this can also be uh, compared with uh, experiments. And let me just skip this because I want to say at least a few words about, so, uh, about the three-dimensional case. And this is also uh, in collaboration with the experiments. So this is now really three-dimensional vesicles and we have many particles inside. The particles now are really uh, spherical particles. I, I, I explained this here. Maybe I should start the movie because this is a, quite a long movie. Yeah, you see, uh, so this is uh, the experiments were done uh, by other collaborators at ETH Zurich. So this is giant unimal lemon vesicles. In this case, it's uh, Janus particles, Janus spheres, which are driven by this hydrogen peroxide uh, reaction. This is the standard diffuser phoretic uh, particle. And you see here in the case of low tension, the particles cluster form this little cluster and they pull a tether, I started again. Yeah, so they cluster and they form this little tether here. So a few particles are clustering and you see a tether is, tether is difficult to see, but you see it's still somehow not moving away. So this must still be connected to the, to the main vesicle. And th this is for low membrane tension. If you do high membrane tension, the membrane tension is so large that it somehow uh, prevents this uh, tether formation to happen. Yeah, so uh, we have done uh, Monte Carlo simulation, molecular dynamics, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, simulations uh, for such a system. In this case, we take active, active Brownian uh, spheres for the uh, self-propelled particles and the fluid vesicle is described 
by a dynamically triangulated membrane. I don't want to go into the details now. Um, and you see uh, a very similar behavior. Yeah, you see that particles clash, so they form uh, these uh, very strong uh, tethers. And this is an reg a regime now where the tethering is quite uh, pronounced because there are a, this is a strong propulsion force. Therefore, it's more pronounced than what you saw on the, uh, in the experiments. Now here is a comparison between experimental shapes, experimentally observed shapes and what has been seen in experiments. And essentially you have to look at it um, in this way that the top row uh, shows this, what I've shown you in the movie, it shows this formation of the tether. And here is a similar uh, configuration which has been uh, found in the simulations. Similarly here, this is the uh, movie I showed from the simulations and you can saw, see similar tether with uh, several particles here at the bottom of the experimental graph. You can find um, uh, here, for example, uh, strong, more strong uh, deformations where uh, at high concentrations or even the formation of this uh, bola-like shape here at the bottom. So overall, I would say there's quite a good correspondence between an experiment and simulations. Um, one advantage of the simulations is that you can easily uh, vary the peculiar number, the, the propulsion strength. This is actually quite difficult to do in these experiments because if the concentration of hydrogen peroxide is too large, you find a bubble formation of uh, hydrogen bubbles. And that somehow um, makes the whole system uh, very complicated and difficult to interpret. So therefore the experiment was essentially done just by a single uh, propulsion strength. Whereas here we can construct the whole phase diagram as a function uh, uh, of Peclet number here uh, upwards and uh, particle volume fraction uh, in the X direction. Yeah, and then you see that there is a regime of fluctuating roughly spherical shapes. If the uh, propulsion strength is high, you see the tether formation. And then if the uh, particle concentration is very large, then uh, we see this formation of prolate shapes or, or bola type uh, vesicle shapes. Yeah, and I can give you a, a little explanation, hand waving explanation for how this happens. Well, there are uh, two competing methods or maybe three competing me mechanisms. Yeah, the one is that, of course, self-propelled particles generate a local force on the membrane. Yeah, this is very similar to what people have done for colloids, which are attached to the to a membrane and pulled by an external laser tweezer. And then they, they see this tether formation. Now, in this case, the, the uh, force is generated not externally by laser tweezer, but internally by this propulsion strength. And that, if that uh, propulsion strength is big enough, or this force is big enough, yeah, then it overcomes the bending rigidity and tension of the membrane, and then you see the, the formation of the tether. Yeah? So the propulsion works against membrane uh, rigidity and tension, and whatever dominates, either you see the tether or, or not. Yeah, and of course, tether, uh, you need a big enough force, and therefore this uh, happens at large activities. So this is essentially for if you think of a single particle. Yeah, and um, if you think of many particles, but then they form, can form clusters, and that leads to a stronger propulsion force, and therefore this enhances the tether formation. On the other hand, they also cover a larger part of the surface, so particles are pulling or pushing on different parts of the surface. And that uh, is called a swim pressure. And that while, uh, if you think of the Laplace, swim pressure as a Laplace pressure, that acts, uh, uh, generates an active membrane tension. And as we have seen in this uh, um, experimental movie, in this case, it was a passive tension, but if the tension is too big, then this suppresses uh, the tether formation. Yeah. and. Uh, we can put this into equation. I will uh, spare you from going through this in detail. Just show you the, the results. Yeah, so the, this little theory uh, is the, here the, the uh, full and dashed line. This is for single particles. And that uh, explains the uh, transition from these fluctuating vesicles to the formation of a few tethers. 
Yeah? So this becomes more difficult with increasing particle number because active pressure appears. Now, the second line is here for clusters. If you allow particles to cluster, but right, then this becomes again more easy to, to form tethers. Therefore, this line goes down. But if the concentration becomes even bigger, then uh, again, also the active tension starts to become even larger. And therefore, the active tension again suppresses the, uh, the formation of individual tethers. And you see rather this kind of uh, global vesic uh, vesicle deformation. Okay, um, I think I'm, uh, okay, let me just not go into the details here. I just want to say we can also look at the fluctuation of the particles, right? And this would be really uh, mainly here where the uh, vesicle is still roughly in the spherical shape. Uh, we can sti still see the uh, effect of activity to, due to enhanced fluctuations. Let me not go into the details, just look at the results. Yeah, so this is the fluctuation modes. The fluctuation modes. Right? So fluctua uh, this is again a two-dimensional cut to this three-dimensional uh, vesicle. Therefore, we have only one wave number, which you can think of the uh, wave number with um, mode number L. Yeah, and um, so what you see is for large uh, wave numbers, so short wavelength fluctuation. This is essentially the same behavior which you would expect for passive particles. But for low wave numbers, this is uh, beha the behavior you would expect for passive vesicles uh, with some small tension. But in this regime, uh, the activity plays a big role and it change changes the power law behavior from L to the minus one extra to L to the minus four. And you see here the two exponents, the, the bluish line here corresponds to the large L behavior that is roughly constant. But for small uh, L, you see this dramatic change as a function of Peclet number. Uh, if the Peclet number is zero, you have uh, L to the minus um, three. Okay, this is, uh, this is this, this middle regime, which is where there is essentially no, uh, sorry, sorry, this is L to the minus one, which you see here. But then as Peclet number increases, yeah, you, you get, go to higher and higher uh, exponents. So, uh, active fluctuations become more and more um, prominent, uh, important for small wavelengths. And you can see a similar behavior here uh, also in the experiments. All right, so then let me just uh, finish. Cannot finish anymore. Um, oops, no. Okay, so uh, my conclusion about the second part is uh, cell motility is determined by this interplane of membrane deformability, external friction and boundary forces the internal force reorganization and the pushing and or pulling the existence of possible pushing and pulling filaments. I've shown you that there's this emergence of cell shape velocity and sensing together. They are sensing in the sense that particles, this collect this complex particle can actually sense the wall or sense uh, an interface. And we have this, yeah, this is this uh, next point, this scattering uh, deflection. Uh, uh, at interfaces may be an interesting approach to study selectivity. And in the final, finally, I've shown you the sculpting of vesicles with uh, external, uh, with active particles, and that leads to many uh, interesting non equilibrium shapes. All right, I would like to thank all the members of uh, the theory of living matter group here in, in Jülich. This was in part funded by the DFG priority program on, on micro swimmers. And of course, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot. So are there more questions from the second part? Um, so Gerhard, can, you, can I ask you uh, one yeah. question? So in one of the early slides you had uh, for the flexible membranes, um, you had this relation between, you know, you had the grouping of different motility with the sphericity, uh, right? In one of the, you had this phase diagram. Um, um. You are talking about 2D stuff, right? 2D stuff, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, that's one. Yeah. So, is there any simple explanation um, for this sort of uh, connection, like a grouping of this motility for asphericity, or this difference is happening? Is it because the change in active forces, or is it 
as more. I say, the, the, the change of the active, I mean, the, 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 the trivial factors have, have been scaled out. Yeah? As you say, I mean, if I take twice as many filaments, of course, the propulsion strength is twice as big, so the velocity is twice as big, roughly speaking. So therefore, we have div divided by the number of propelling filaments, and we have divided by the activity. Right, right. Yeah. So that, that is scaled out. So, so what I think what you see here is the effect of, of, of shape. Yeah? So that means if you have a, essentially a spherical object, a circular object, right? and the pulling forces are somehow randomly distributed because, um, not, okay, I, I should say, um, maybe this is a point I've, I've not emphasized enough. Yeah. So here, here in this case, right, all the pulling filaments are collected here in the beginning, uh, here on the front, because uh, if there's a curvature, then uh, the, the, the pulling particles somehow collect at the region of high uh, uh, concavity. Right, right. Yeah, right. That because they are, are pushing forward. And if, if it's concave, then they have a difficulty to, to, to move away from it. Right. Whereas if it's uh, convex, then of course they can move easily, very easily away from it. Yeah, right. so, so therefore, they are collecting here in the front. And the pushing filaments, they try to flatten the membrane, right? They're pulling on the membrane, therefore they are trying to make a curvature in the opposite direction, and there they collect for the same reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so therefore you have this ordering that all the uh, pulling and pushing filaments are more or less um, pushing in the same direction, and therefore they are uh, moving, quote, quickly. Yeah, and now, if you if you look at the neutrophil shape, and uh, I, maybe I should explain, which I have not done before. So we have two neutrophil shapes, the mono and the bi. And the reason is the the mono means there is one uh, region in front where all the particles are pushing forward, and all the pulling particles in the back. And they do not do much, right? Because they are quote opposing each other in in their direction of of propulsion. And the bi shape has also a little cluster of uh, pushing filaments in the rear, which is pushing in the opposite direction, right? For mm. the same reason, right? It's a highly curved region, and therefore they they collect, and therefore the bi is moving less quickly than uh, than the yeah, the mono the mono shapes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank I, you. I hope that explains it a bit. Yeah. 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 Uh, Mitun. Uh... Yeah, hi. so the, when you were showing these experiments on the Janus particles in like yeah. this, so you, I, you said that it, changing the speed of the particles is different because of experimental constraints, but for the experiments that were done, is it possible to estimate what, uh, like where in the Peclet axis I should try to look at if I were trying to correlate these experimental results to the simulations? Yeah, uh, yeah. That's, I mean, this, this is actually, Unfortunately, more, more difficult than than uh, than it seems, right? Because I mean, if you if you look at the experimental shapes, then I would say they are. Um, yeah, if you if you look here, right? Um, and of course, I mean, sorry, they, they they can of course also change the concentration, right? That that is of course uh, possible, right? That that you also see here, right? These these part uh, these this case here has of course. Uh, um, can can you see what? Um, yeah, yeah I, I can. I, you can see my my pointer. Yeah, yeah, I can see the mouse. Yeah. Okay, so but here, of course, they have more particles inside than than here on the top. Okay. So concentration can, of course, be changed. Yeah, mm -hmm. but then and then if you look at the, the the shapes we see here, and you compare it with the phase diagram, right? Then mm -hmm. yeah, then you would say, okay, it must be here somewhere in the middle. Yeah, Pickley mm -hmm. order whatever, 150, 200. Okay. Yeah, but. But if you do the calculation and you say, okay, how fast is this particle actually moving without a membrane, mm -hmm. then you get a, a, a significantly smaller Pegli number, right? I, I can't remember the number exactly, around 50. Okay. But, but uh, as I said, but the, it, I think it's a little bit more difficult uh, because uh, the, the, the particles are mostly close to the membrane. So we don't know exactly what this means for, say, the hydrogen peroxide concentration. Uh, it could be depleted locally, uh, mm -hmm. or maybe uh, the, the hydrogen peroxide diffuses in from the outside, and therefore uh, it actually a higher uh, hydrogen peroxide concentration. You also don't really know what happens if they move in a tether. That's a, again, does that is there is there a hydrodynamic flow which uh, which changes things? So, 
so okay so so um uh, long story short is we, we, we have not been able to really make a detailed uh, prediction of Peclet number uh, and said, okay, and this is exactly this this part in the phase diagram. It's it's I more see. of a, a qualitative comparison. But regarding this other thing about, like you said, you are changing the concentration in the experiments, but does that match up sort of like, it? does it lead to more of these prolate shapes with increasing concentration? I mean, there's another stuff which I didn't tell you about the experiments. Uh, so I answer your question. You, you have to remind me about your question in a second. But the, sure, sure. <laughs> the experiments are done uh, in a, in a, on a cover slide. Yeah. So the the um, I think they have probably a high sh a sugar concentration, or maybe the particles are heavier, and they sink to the bottom and flatten somehow. So this is not. So what what you see here is somehow uh, pancake like uh, shapes. Yeah, which you mm -hmm. see from the top or from the bottom. But they have not; they are not uh, have not the same extension uh, normal to the surface. I see. Yeah, yeah. So, so therefore, we compare three-dimensional simulations with exactly two-dimensional. Well, it's also not really two-dimensional; it's somewhere between two-dimensional, three-dimensional, in the experiments. So that again makes the comparison uh, a bit I more tricky. That. So oh. now, but please, please remind me about, about your question again. No, I was saying that whether it is observed in the experiments that with increasing concentration, you get more of these prolate, uh, prolate shapes uh, that was there in the phase diagram, the simulation phase diagram. Yeah, I think that is that you see here, right? I mean, uh, I mean, if you look again, uh, uh, he, I mean, the, so the, 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 this, this top part is the low concentration, and then here this uh, lower left part is the higher concentration, and you see yeah, here, for example, these polar shapes, or this almost two, uh, connected by a small tether or here. Uh, okay. I, I think okay. they also saw some topology changes, which we could not do because, uh, I mean, our by construction, our membrane has a fixed topology. I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Uh, Monica, can you unmute? Uh, yeah. So, so in the flexible polymer, so what is the yeah. idea behind? Uh, what is the idea behind the modeling of the membrane and? the spring connected polymers. So do we see such uh, something similar in the experiments? So you are talking about uh, th th this kind of right. modeling? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the idea is uh, essentially to model the, the cytoskeleton somehow, right? To say, yeah, the cytoskeleton is this um, active filaments which push against the membrane, either driven by polymerization or driven by by motor activity, and this is what we try to to mimic by these uh, uh, filaments, right? Whether this is then due to polymerization or to uh, motor activity, I think that's uh, to to zeroth order does not make such a big uh, difference, right? Because you can think of a a moving uh, polymer, a moving rod, also by thinking I cut a little uh, piece away at the uh, at the end and I add it in in the front. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, yeah, th thanks for the great talk. Uh, so I have a question from the first half. Uh, this is Nitin here. Sure. Uh, so uh, in that motility assay of actin filaments, I think they also saw a phase where there was traveling bands of filaments, uh, yeah. like a layering of filaments. So did you did you see that in your simulation in any parameter space? We never. I mean, we ne never saw banding. Um, oh. I and I don't. Nobody who has looked at self-propelled rods has ever see, seen a bending. I mean, there's a little uh, exception. I think there was a simulation by uh, Erwin Frey and uh, Andreas Bausch, uh, mm -hmm. where they also take polymer-like chains. Actually, I mean, a, a model is, is quite similar to what we are doing for the flexible polymers, uh, but they have done it on a lattice. So I mean, the the, the, the polymers move on a lattice. So they have only discrete. Uh, uh, orientational. I mean, so so each 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 bond somehow of the chain can only have a discrete angle in in space. And I think they mm -hmm. saw they saw the bands. But this is the only, and I've never understood what, what what's the difference between this uh, this model and and our kind of model. All I can say is all the mm -hmm. rigid rod models at least have always ever seen these kind of clusters, similar type mm -hmm. of clusters which I've shown you here. And uh, I mean, for our polymer chairs, we also have only seen these somehow elongated clusters, never the bands. Mm. This seems to be some subtle um, 
subtle thing. I mean, we were discussing um, the continuous version of uh, the witch, of a witch egg model uh, so, uh, recently, and I mean, this is kind of surprising. People have, I mean, this is not our our observation, but people have seen that if you take a, a witch egg type model in the continuum, you have to be very careful to to say how you make this alignment rule with the neighbors, yeah, and depending on how you actually do it you may either see bands or you see clusters. So my feeling now is that this is really a very special effect of this uh, Vichic type models um, that you see the bands. So, so, but you are not directly putting in the alignment interaction, uh, alignment rule, right? Like they're, they're, they're repelling each other, yeah. uh, hardcore uh, repulsion and okay. Yeah, so um, we have hardcore repulsion and there is a little yeah. bias I mean, if they collide, mm -hmm. there's a little bias in the forward direction, which comes from that this is a chain of beats. So there is a little ah. kind of friction, which uh, nice. when, 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 when these chains of beat, beats hit each other, there's a little kind of friction, which mm -hmm. uh, prefers the alignment in the polar direction rather than the alignment in, in 180 degree direction. I see, I see. Okay, yeah, so thank I, you. I would say from, yeah. from my point of view, I mean, this is a very a valid question, a reasonable question, and it always was in the back of my mind, but we never, never, never managed to, to really clarify it. Or, I mean, we, mm -hmm. we never looked at it in much sufficient detail to really clarify mm -hmm. it. Okay, okay, thanks, thanks. Sure, sure. Are there any more questions? Okay, so if there are no more questions, I would like to thank Gerhard for this wonderful and exciting talk and you know we had a lot of discussions around the results um, so yeah thank you Gerard. and our next colloquium will be in june 8th of june and you'll have uh, ignacio paganabaraga as a speaker okay. thank you very good yeah thank, thank you, you all much. for coming and uh, for the nice discussion thanks right. thank you thank you, thank you very Bye. much thank you